Welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sachs. And I'm Lori Sachs. And today we are joined by Stephen Gustafson, a founding member of the group 10,000 Maniacs. Stephen's oldest sister, Kathy, had Down syndrome, and today he shares with us personal stories about advocacy and the impact of having a sibling with Down syndrome. Stephen's parents were advocates, I think, maybe before that word was a popular thing. They were pioneers of advocacy, and they created change just by doing things differently. And the stories that Stephen shares are beautiful tributes to his sister, Kathy, and the impact that she had on his life. On a personal note, we are big fans of 10,000 Maniacs, so a little smitten going into this interview. So here it is, our gift to you this interview with Stephen Gustafson, which was a tremendous gift to us. Hey. Hi, Steve. How are you? Is it Stephen or Steve? Around here, I'm called Daddy-O. <laughs> daddy right, daddy Okay. Daddy-O. <laughs> but Steve works fine. Well, really good to have you on the podcast today. I was uh, very excited. Oh, me too. Thanks for having me. Well, we were really excited. Stephen um, saw your post about your sister, and thanks for uh, coming on today to share share your story about her because a lot of the times people have questions about how having a sibling with Down syndrome will affect their other children. And I think this is going to be a really great episode to uh, alleviate some of those fears and concerns. So thank you so much for coming on today. You're welcome. You know, we did uh, prep a, f- a few questions here just to kind of lead in, but maybe just tell us, a, tell us and our listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, there's a lot to tell because I'm old, but uh, I was born in 1957. Uh, My dad was in the United States Air Force. He retired in 64 and they moved back home to care for um, my mom's father. And so I grew up in the house that she grew up in and went to schools that she did. We always had music around our house. I loved listening to it. My dad had an old guitar of his father's. I taught myself how to play guitar. and went to Jamestown Community College uh, where a friend of mine from high school and I uh, were in the ground floor of starting a uh, 10 watt non-commercial radio station. This was in 1976 or 77. And then this new music came along called New Wave and Punk Rock. And we really sort of got into that, that sort of whole do-it-yourself style of music. At the radio station, a young, young lady, I think she was much, might have been 16 when she started at the college, named Natalie Merchant, came and joined our radio station uh, as a DJ and painting the walls and stuff because she was very artistic. And, you know, we just started a band, uh, really to entertain ourselves, and um, asked Natalie if she wanted to come down to our rehearsal space in an old uh, warehouse, and she did. And, you know, it was mostly just smoking pot and listening to music and playing songs and having parties. And, uh, uh, but it was really fun. And we weren't very good at playing our instruments. So, and we couldn't play, you know, Stairway to Heaven. So we just wrote our own songs. And the first gig we played in Erie, Pennsylvania in 19, February, 1981, we got kicked out for having an argument with the bar owner. And uh, there's another story to it, but I won't get into that. But we thought that was the greatest. And the Fredonia State University up the road from us had a um, Tonemeister program, audio engineering. So we wrote, we took our songs up to the uh, school and we were part of a senior project. And we recorded five songs and pressed them on vinyl. 
And because of our connections from our radio station, we knew a bunch of other college radio stations around the East Coast. We'd call them up and say, where do bands play? And so we booked, we bought an old mini school bus van, uh, booked our own tour down to Florida where my folks lived. And we'd zigzag down the East Coast to uh, Bradenton, Florida and go to their house and rest for a week or so. And my dad said we'd eat all their food, drink all their liquor and use up all their hot water. And uh, <laughs> then book shows going back home to Jamestown. And we did that, uh, we did that run three times in the fall of uh, 83. And we sent uh, our second uh, independent record to uh, a DJ in London, John Peel, who was on the BBC One. He was sort of the, the hip DJ and he liked one of our songs and it got voted in his, his listener poll for that year, the 23rd out of 50. And on the strength of that, uh, we got three gigs in London. And on the strength of that from press that we received, we eventually got a record contract here in the States in uh, uh, November, 1984 uh, with Electra Records and started making records for them. Our first one didn't do so well, The Wishing Chair, which is 35 years old. And uh, uh, they let us, back then record companies had lots of money from sales of CDs. So they would invest in our artists since, you know, if, if your record didn't sell right away. So we did another record in my tribe and that went, um, that went gold and that got us on some uh, important radio stations and that got us on late night television. Uh, actually it was Johnny Carson show back then, but it was Jay Leno was a host and David Letterman. Uh, and that got us more tours, more gigs. And, you know, it just worked. You know, we made some decent money back then. And my wife and I just had our first child. So we bought some land out here in Frewsburg, New York and uh, built a house, which is what you're looking at right now. We've been here 27 years. And in the tw uh, 2000s, I worked as a technical director and producer of musicals at Jamestown Community College. I just retired from that right before the pandemic hit, which was really kind of a brilliant move on my part, although I didn't know, I didn't know it then. And uh, I collect social security. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So, so family, family's a big thing for you. You're still in the, the same, same town. And that, that seems to be a huge, huge part of your story. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of feel like a king here, you know, everyone knows me and uh, we know the mayor and, you know, it's just small enough. Uh, we owned a restaurant, my uh, keyboard player, in my band, my best friend, we bought, owned a restaurant for a while. And, uh, uh, it, he described it as like we each bought brand new Range Rovers and pushed them off a cliff <laughs> <laughs> because it failed miserably with our uh, combination of ignorance and arrogance. Um, but, you know, I like it here. It's my hometown. We, my wife and I really wanted our children to, to go to the same schools their entire life and live in one place. And, uh, and we did that. And so now we're pretty much empty nesters. Uh, my son had to move back with us because of the pandemic, but we, my daughter got married here last month. We danced to a 10,000 Maniacs song. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your sister, Kathy. Well, she's the oldest of three. Um, she was born in 1949. Our middle sister, Leanne, was born uh, in 52, and I was born in 57. You know, my dad was in the Air Force, so he traveled a bit. And when I was born, he was stationed in Madrid, Spain. And Kathy and Leanne had lived there for almost five years. So Kathy actually knew Spanish, at least a little bit. And um, they, after I was born, they moved back to the States and we moved to Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, SAC headquarters where, uh, you know, till I was six and then he retired and moved back. You know, I didn't think Kathy was any different than Leanne. She was my sister. You know, we didn't live in base housing, but it was close to that. And um, most of the families were very accepting of Kathy. And, you know, it was a lot of kids. That's my dog, Ivan. <laughs> but, um, you know, Kathy, she didn't have, I don't think she really had uh, real good schooling opportunities when we were in Omaha. Uh, and when, when we moved back to Jamestown in 64, there was a uh, 
special needs school. It was really sort of a one room uh, schoolhouse that um, other children with disabilities, of course, they were called mentally retarded back then. And uh, my mom always insisted on, you know, her going to school and uh, learning. And Kathy, she got to reading at a second grade level. She liked to read. <laughs> it changed a little bit when we moved to, uh, to Jamestown, I think, because we were so insulated back in Omaha, living, you know, kind of on an Air Force base. And of course, I was older and I noticed people staring at her kind of not giggling, but, you know, giving that sort of side eye sort of kind of look. And it kind of, it made me uncomfortable. I think the only fight I've ever been in is because someone said something to her and I, one of the kids on the street, next street over. So I got in a tussle with them because they didn't like it. By then I was, you know, 10 years old or something. And I realized that, well, yeah, she's definitely different, but she was never treated different. She was just one of the siblings. And so Kathy, just for our listeners, Kathy is your sister, your older sister that had Down syndrome. When did you first understand what Down syndrome was and how was it presented to you? It wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, you know, when I was older, my parents said Kathy has Down syndrome and I really didn't know what it meant, except that, um, she, I mean, she was different. I thought then in a weird way that she was my oldest sister, but she was my youngest sister because I thought I was smarter than she was, um, although I wasn't. <laughs> uh, my parents um, were very proactive in getting Kathy an education and there was a local achievement center was what it was called. And when she was maybe 18, I think she had to be to go work at the achievement center and they got paid to work there. And it was in a, it was a little, it wasn't little, but it was kind of like a little warehouse room up above a auto store. They mostly made change for the parking ramps and uh, snowman sock puppets and things like that, sort of arts and crafts things, which was great because, you know, Kathy had a bank account and then she would get to spend her money. I mean, they didn't get paid much, but she would get, be able to buy herself things. And my parents became, um, they got on the board of directors. My dad was a, a banker and, and he knew, you know, a lot of the people in the town that had money and he convinced them to invest, you know, donate money to this cause. And they got the achievement center to move into its own building and expanded the, the work that they did. And eventually uh, the resource center of Chautauqua County that it's called now, is the second largest employer in the county. They do military contracts. They make tents for the military. They do things for local industries. There's a local brewery that the, uh, the resource center, they package all their bottles. And for a while, I was even a uh, weekend house parent. So I was always around people with disabilities. I just found them to be very fascinating people. In fact, I talked to my band in a few times, and when we were starting out, we played at uh, local group homes just to play. We'd go, I'd go visit and talk to, um, you know, give speeches or just, you know, meet the clients and things like that. One, one thing that was really made quite an impression on me, there was a church at the corner of our street when I was growing up, and a, a, a woman on Thursday night, she'd come up and play piano for people from the resource center and their parents would bring them over and uh, she'd play sort of ragtime stuff. She was this older woman. And I'd just go, I always went up with Kathy. I'd walk her up and just sit and listen and watch them dance and, and just be around them. And I just, I really enjoyed that time. We found with our daughter that uh, having someone, a sibling in her life that has Down syndrome has taught her some patience, some compassion, she too was it. She too got in her first little scuffle on, on the playground, uh, advocating for her brother. Yeah, she does stick up for him. I mean, she's she's the old. She's an older sister and, and acts sometimes like the mom, you know, which is a typical thing too. But really protects him. And and um, we've we've had discussions with her about that because we can all kind of get in a place where we try to police everything, and we just kind of get really, you know, not overly sensitive, maybe maybe, but we just react. And you just kind of drive yourself crazy if you're going to do that. You have to give people um, the benefit of the doubt that they don't know 
things. They they may be just not educated on on down, what Down syndrome is and and what a disability means. Which I can imagine back then was definitely the case. You you said something. You said that you thought you were smarter than Kathy, but you weren't. Can you talk about what you meant? I don't know. She she just had this you know special quality about herself and the way she sort of viewed the world and other people. She was very accepting of everybody. She sort of treated everybody the same. She had no bias. Uh, and I kind of respected that about her. And she also taught me patience and compassion. And my, my time uh, being around so many people with disabilities, uh, I think uh, had a lot to do with that. I wanted to ask you, so when you went off to school and you did you, you, you left home, did you live at school? And, and how did you carry her with you? How did that affect you in school? Well, uh, I, was, I was a very selfish uh, older teenager, I think. But uh, Jamestown Community College was, you know, five miles down the road and I lived at home. In fact, I lived at home until my parents sold their house and moved to Florida, <laughs> <laughs> leaving me homeless. Uh, um, and that was right about the time when the band started. You know, so I didn't see Kathy a lot. I mean, although I'd see her in, you know, in the evenings at home, but I was busy dating and going out to bars and being at school all day and sort of, and you know, for a while I had an apartment and I'd come home when I needed, uh, you know, to do laundry and things like that. But I was very sort of busy with my own life. And then the band started and I left, you know, I started traveling. And then my parents and Kathy moved to Florida, so I didn't get to see her much, except maybe when we'd, when we'd be down there. And in fact, we played for their research, we played a concert for their resource center too. That, that was a riot. Uh, you know, just a lot of memories and a lot of very sort of crazy stories. My parents were very, let Kathy be very independent. And they really ignored what other people would say, or, uh, you know, they didn't bother with any of that. That was wasted time. You know, they work, would work all day. Kathy would be at the Achievement Center and then come home. You know, my mom or dad would pick her up and she'd come home. And then my parents would go out. You know, they were members of the American Legion. And, and Kathy was home a lot, sometimes by herself. And my parents were fine with that. You know, and she did a few stupid things, but almost burned the house down once. But, uh, uh, and I'll tell you that story. Uh, we lived in a house of smokers. There was a lot of uh, cigarette smoking going on. And my parents, I think, were taking Leanne to college. I was about 14, I think. And I came home and uh, walked in the door and Kat, I heard Kathy rummaging around in a room, which always meant something was up. And so I, I yelled up, you know, what's going on? She, she didn't say anything. So I knew something was really up. <laughs> so I went up to her room and there was a burn hole in her in her blanket about four feet by three feet in her wool blanket on her bed. And I said, Kathy, you know, what happened? And she didn't say anything. And I said, it's okay. You know, I'll smooth it out with mom and dad. What happened? And uh, she tried to light a cigarette with a kitchen match and it flamed up and burned her eyebrows and she threw it and it landed on her bed. And she knew enough to put the fire out, which amazed me. You are eight years younger than Kathy, and so these are some of these questions I ask you will probably have to be just things you heard passed down to you, but do you know how your parents were told about Kathy's disability and, and how they reacted to it and how people reacted around them? Well, Kathy was born here in Jamestown, New York, and this was 49. Very soon after that, they took her to a specialist at a hospital in Buffalo, New York, you know, to see what could be done. Cause you know, I don't think they knew what it was. I don't think anyone did really, or ma many people didn't. And the doctors there said, oh, you just leave her with us. We'll take care of her. And my mom would have none of it. You know, she was her daughter, their first daughter too. So I think it was a little scary for them, you know, their firstborn. And then they thought, well, are the rest of our children gonna have Down syndrome? You know, they didn't know. So, you know, I, I think at first it was obviously there was some sadness because she wasn't a normal child, but that soon passed, you know, 
She was just their child. That was just as simple as that. She's our daughter. What are you going to do? Love her. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> and they did. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the key is, uh, is for parents to know. And, and for your parents back in 1949, I can only imagine what a challenge that was for them at the foundation of the perception that we're we are still challenged with today is um, the mindset that they had about Down syndrome when Kathy was born. Did your parents ever talk to you about the support or any of their challenges or how they saw it through? Well, you know, they, they sacrificed a lot. I know that when we first moved back to the States, my dad was actually stationed way up uh, northern Maine in Loring at an Air Force base. And I was, you know, a year old. But my mother found a school that would accept Kathy that had a special education department, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term. And um, it was 40 miles away. And my mother drove over there and back every day because, you know, Kathy was nine or 10 and she just wanted her in school. She belonged in school. Our middle sister, Leanne, you know, had to share a room with Kathy. So, you know, she taught Kathy how to tie her shoes and, you know, she was, she helped a lot. And they were closer in age, correct? Yeah, they were just three years apart. Well, because what we experience and what I'm hearing from you is your relationship and reality at home with Kathy as far as supporting her abilities and even just coming in and having that conversation and saying that's a typical sibling relationship where you say I'm going to smooth things over with mom and dad and acknowledging the fact that she didn't burn down the house because if if my daughter Sophia started that, she might have just walked out of the house and, you know, and just and let it and ran and let it burn. And she's our typical daughter. So it's like that's a huge acknowledgement to the fact that the outside perception, which I, I feel in our lives causes most of our challenges and what we really experience at home. It sounds like it's very similar to what maybe you experienced. Yeah, it sounds like people you talk to that have siblings with Down syndrome or or are parents of children with Down syndrome, you you find out that your life is more normal than you ever thought it was going to be when you you look back at, you know, for parents when they first get a diagnosis, there's all kind of things that go through your your mind, but it just becomes your life and it's, it's normal. Well, I, th- I certainly think it's different for parents than it is for a sibling. You know, sibling rivalries and sibling arguments and playing games together and wanting to win. And, you know, although I like to let Kathy beat me at checkers a lot because it made her happy. But it's very challenging for, uh, for parents, I think, you know, because Kathy was just my sister. We play kickball in the backyard. And- one time, oh my gosh, you know, I was letting her around the bases and I chucked the, the ball at her, hit her in her feet and then knocked her down. She hit her head in the fender of the car. I was like, oh God, what am I going to do? She was okay. And can, can you talk a little bit about that, about your sibling rivalry and your relationship with her? Because it is a different relationship. I mean, a parent uh, is yeah, and so th- responsible for the child, you know, and there's these pressures. But yeah, there's... there's um... And honestly, especially when you're talking about a time that was so different than now, you know, that's that's a lot of concern that we see still. Parents are so concerned with the effect that having a child with Down syndrome is going to have on their other children. So... Can you just... That it's going to be negative. Yeah, a negative effect. And maybe you can tell a little stories to put them at ease. I think uh, because I was the only boy and I didn't play as much with Leanne because, you know, she was more mature and she had her girlfriends. And uh, so I I played more with Kathy. Cards, you know, playing hearts. And because when my middle sister went off to, uh, to college, you know, it was just Kathy and I in the home. We, we do stuff, but Kathy liked to read and watch TV and do, she uh, made pot holders. She just loved to do that. And um, so she had her, she had her hobbies and uh, her interests. And, you know, and like I said, I was, you know, I was just kind of sometimes very selfish and self, well, more self-centered, not, the, not selfish, but self-centered because I was growing up. 
Although my wife might say I haven't grown up yet. <laughs> <laughs> the things that you had mentioned as far as having her as a sibling and even just letting her win at checkers, that's not something that most siblings will do for each other. So is that like a, is that a quality that kind of resonated in you as you got older? Just that, I don't know if you would call it just, I don't know, empathy or um, at your foundation. Your foundation isn't, I'm going to win, win, win. Your foundation is sometimes letting someone else win because it, it makes them happy. And is that something that, that you, you carried into your adult life? Absolutely. You know, I like to be fair. Um, I like to, I like to boss people around in in my uh, in the band and things like that because I'm sort of an A personality kind of guy, and I'd rather do it myself, sort of thing. But what's so important, you know, that you have to win all the time? Life's a game. I like to play it, the game of life, and um, I, I like to have fun. And I like, you know, I like to laugh, uh, be around the family, and Kathy. It helped me understand that, I think, just to be kind to people and especially strangers. And I want to I want to go up and say, hi, how you doing? You know, or what are you doing? And parents kind of give me odd looks and I say, oh, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> I'm not a crazy guy. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a maniac, but I'm not a crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> Well, uh, your parents moved down to Bradenton uh, with Kathy and um, Leanne. I was out of the house at that point, I guess. And yeah. and uh, and how was that move for her? And I think it was a challenge for Kathy. You know, she, I mean, she lived so long in in one place. I think moving kind of up, you know, sort of, you know, was confusing to her a little bit. But you know, she acclimated, and you know, she's pretty tough. You know, and then she got into, she got right into a achievement center down there and started working there. Uh, my parents discovered that there were a lot of other parents with adult children with um, disabilities. So they had this idea. They got a bunch of them together and said, all right, fork over some cash. We're going to buy a house and we're going to turn it into a group home for the resource center. And they each kicked in $5,000, had enough for a down payment, bought a house had it fixed up with probably a lot of the work donated and started a group home. Uh, and it was the best thing for her. She was suddenly really an adult and didn't have to rely on my parents for things and didn't, you know, and it's just like any, you know, child would get out from underneath their parents and uh, she thrived. They had a pool, she learned how to swim. She, you know, she was getting paid again. She got a job working for the hospital folding clothes in the laundry. She took a city bus, transferred to another bus, got to work, worked, uh, and then got on the bus and changed buses again and went back to her group home. The couple that ran it were just fabulous people. Kathy really loved them and considered them her second parents. And, you know, and she thrived doing that. She just, she loved being in her group home. Well, creating a like one of the first group homes is so it's so revolutionary just to your your parents, the advocates that they were, I think even maybe before that word was so prominent in the Down syndrome community, but just it sounds like just from doing they they advocated and made these changes that are really at the foundation of the changes that we're still pursuing. I mean, to fight for an education before idea was even around <clears throat> is um, we have a lot of thanks and a lot of gratitude for what your parents did, just taking their daughter home and going against the grain. That's the, the I mean, the strength and the courage that they had. Um, we think about that sometimes that yeah. Liam was our, our second child. And we do, we do think about if Liam was our first child, that does set differently in, in your in your mind and in, in, in when you're going to have more kids or you're thinking of having more yeah. kids. Yeah, and especially at a time when the, I, I can only imagine what they were told. And, I, you know, you can look up in the medical books what they were told, but to yeah. actually experience that in life, they, uh, they, they were definitely advocates without wearing that title and creating a first home and showing people as far as independence. Like, you know, we all, we all just want, to have our path in life. We all just want to, to be able to live that life. And, 
And All I of think us. That's, yeah, and I think that's really incredible. Did did Kathy ever talk about the jobs that were offered and given her? Did she ever talk about maybe she wanted to do more, or was she just happy doing those jobs? Well, I think she took a lot of pride in what she did. You know, she would loom potholders and sell them to all my parents' friends, and she'd rake into cash for that. <laughs> I, <bet. laughs> I think more that, uh, that she made at the resource center. Um, and she liked earning money. She thought that was the coolest thing and having a bank account. Well, that was freedom. Yeah. She could buy her own stuff, her own records, you know. What kind of music did she like? Well, our father wouldn't let us watch the Beatles the first time they were on it, the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, so we were huge Beatle fans. And uh, Leanne, our middle sister, uh, she, you know, she was into all that, the, the British invasion stuff and hermits, hermits, and she liked Laura Nero. So we'd, you know, we'd listen to a lot of Leanne's records and uh, Kathy, you know, she liked them too. And my sister had original Beatle releases on the VJ record label, their first releases. Leanne got them, you know, right when they came out. And Kathy wrote her name all over them. <laughs> 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 just, Kathy Gustafson <laughs> over all of the Beatles records. Like, no. <laughs> oh, my sister was so mad. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> um, so she she loved um, she loved John Denver, you know. But it was it was a lot of Beatles around our house all the time. Can you tell us a little bit about the camp that you guys volunteered at? And the camp, camp planter is that what you? Corn mean? planter. Corn planter. Okay. Corn planter was a, um, I think he was a Seneca Indian, uh, you know, long ago, and he actually did some negotiating with the uh, with the federal government for land and things like that. Um, and this is in Allegheny National Forest. So there were eight cabins up on a, a ring uh, above a valley on a hill. A wonderful woman, Annabelle Bollinger, uh, started it because she had a son with disabilities, Billy. And my parents heard about it. Uh, I don't know how, but Kathy started going one week a summer. Just this beautiful spot in the woods with a, in, in a valley and a big open field. And there was a, a mess hall and a, they had a pool, a rec hall. So Kathy would go there and she just loved it. And then I think 69, my sister Leanne went to work there. We didn't volunteer. We got paid $20 a week. So it was close to volunteer. <laughs> and you'd work, uh, it was eight weeks long, basically work six days a week. Campers would come on Sunday and go, go home on Saturday. So everyone had Saturday afternoon till Sunday morning off. And we'd all just go out drinking somewhere and stay at each other's houses. And I worked there for four summers. I was a counselor and there were, eight cabins, four cabins of females, four cabins of males, uh, ages six to 60, um, all ranges of abilities and disabilities. It was probably, uh, besides maybe being a father and watching my daughter get married, it was, and being in a famous rock band, it, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was the best time of my life. And everyone who worked there just loved it. I, you know, they wouldn't let anything like that go on now. The toilets were outhouses. Sinks, you know, were just cold water. And, you know, they had a nurse. And uh, I actually, um, I had to save a boy's life. He was choking. And I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know much about CPR. But I just started blowing into his lungs. And, uh, you know, and he, he lived. I actually wrote a song about him. It was the first song I ever wrote. Wow. Michael, Mikey Langendorfer. So we had programming. There'd be uh, arts and crafts and music class and sports, and which was usually swimming in the pool. Big in-ground pool. It must have been 50, 50 feet long. It was, it was massive. And of course, we'd have to do polar bear once a week. So we'd get up in the morning <laughs> at 8 o'clock and go jump in the pool. <laughs> and then like Thursday nights, we'd have a show for each cabin would put on a little performance and you'd work on it during the week. One of the staffers would be chief corn planter and they'd put on the feathers and the loincloth and we'd sit around the big fire pit and they had a little gas line running underneath the, uh, the fire pit and uh, a, a spark and he'd come out and he'd say, uh, 
you welcome all the campers and say, Hoya Toya, let there be fire. And the thing would, the fire pit would, you know, would light up and uh, we'd sit and sing, you know, camp songs. This little corn planter light of mine, I'm going to let it shine and, uh, you know, stuff like that. But uh, it, it's where I first fell in love because they were really cute girl counselors. And uh, <laughs> I made better friends there than I did in, you know, in high school. It was, it was fabulous. I worked there for four summers. And then, it, you know, they couldn't pay people $25 a week, you know, after 1980. They just, you know, they couldn't find people to work for that. So it finally closed. The, you know, the building started falling down. The counselors, we'd get together, we'd have, we'd have reunions, and we'd, we'd make a pilgrimage out to the camp and walk around and tell stories. And it, it was magical just magical. There's two things here. For you, it was the best time of your life and it was magical. And, and I think that perhaps even people who got to go there maybe and be amongst their own and there must have been like a freedom there to, to the community that was created. And then from the outside, looking back, you look at like the, you know, outhouses and cold water sinks. There's, there's such a dichotomy there to, you know, these, this wasn't the, what is it called? The four seasons. No, this wasn't the four seasons. Like this is what was offered up. It wasn't a up. day's in. <laughs> right. Right. This is what was offered up. But yet it, in that disarray there, it was actually such a, such a gift. And, did the um did the campers ever talk about how they felt being there? I mean, it must have been just being away from home. You talked about some of the kids were, you know, naturally afraid to be away, but did they ever talk about just having that freedom and have the relationships and, they made? And- yeah, uh, you know, they really felt that independence, and you know, they felt like they were, you know, kings and queens out in you know in this magic land in the forest. It was a lot of happy, you know, a lot of singing and playing, you know, and acting and getting to run around in fresh air for days, you know, campfires. I mean, how can you how can you go wrong with that campfires? And you were playing at this time. You were you had were 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 playing instruments at this time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I brought my guitar. You know, I bring my acoustic guitar with me, and you know, and sit in a cabin and play until the other counselors would tell me to shut up. Uh, uh, and I thought it impressed the girls too, you know, so, uh, uh, but uh, I, you know, I wasn't really in a band or anything. It wasn't until I was, I was 23 when uh, 10,000 Maniacs started. Did Kathy influence your music and, and if she, and how? Well, uh, Kathy loved to sing. She sang all the time. She loved it. Also, you know, there was always music around our house. My parents played records all the time. So Kathy grew up with that too, you know, and then her other siblings play music records all the time. And watching me play guitar, you know, going up to the church and seeing Dorothy Brooks pound on the piano and they'd sing and dance. You know, Kathy had a wonderful life. And, and I enjoyed seeing her happy, or, you know, her happiness. And, and you understand this, her smile was infectious. They have a special light about them. It's funny because Stephen and I are coming from a parent's point of view. And, you know, a lot of times we get that they're angels or something like that. And so at the beginning, I think we rejected or we got defensive over some of those statements. But there is definitely there is something. And I wouldn't say Liam's an angel. He definitely is human <laughs> and has every emotion and of a ten year old boy. Of a ten year old yeah. boy, but there is and I don't know how to describe it. It is infectious in a way that there's a percentage of people that he comes in contact with that just just love him right away. Wanna hug him, they wanna hang with him and that's a comfort that as a parent that we have that there's built into society there for as much as we feel like society could change in a lot of ways built into society is a percentage of people that I know will will help Liam if we weren't there or would protect him and also befriend him and he likes himself he he knows he he has friends and he's confident in that way too and the world needs that 
element that can walk into a room and just bring some joy with it. And yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, we, we need that because it's not, it's not a, it's just a natural, um, down syndrome for president. <laughs> right, I, absolutely. Right. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we interviewed a gentleman whose father had down syndrome and just even talking to him, you know, the influence of that element, that compassion, that like what you described as far as Kathy, just, just that love. You could feel it in, in his son, the way he talked about other people, or even just the way we interacted with him from go. It's, it's so special. And I fought that stereotype for so long, but it is something that I think it's, I don't, I can't, I can't describe it, but there's, there's always, there's been something about just his love. And I think it is the unconditional with no ulterior motive and without expectation. Yep. Yep. No ulterior motive. They, all I want is to love and be loved. Right. And it's such, it's so beautiful. It is so. I wish more of us could be like that. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. I wish, I wish I was always like that. I wish yeah. I, I think it took me a while. And then one time I was just observing the way as a human in my life, how I'll go, how I feel about a situation or sometimes I'll second guess if. I'm going to say something or to comfort or, oh, how are they going to take this? And yeah, right. What are they going to think of me? <laughs> right. How are, oh, how is this going to affect my relationship with them? And, you know, you, you can come into a room and Liam would feel if you were upset or mad and he'll ask you. And if you're upset, he just go over. And now he started this new thing and I don't know where he got the wording from, but he'll take your hand and he'll say, it's okay. I'm here. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's just like, yeah. oh damn! Yeah, I don't know where he got that, but oh, it's so it, it just like oh, goes, it's great, oh, <laughs> you know. And it's it's so it's so beautiful, and I th I think people miss out on that, and I think there's so much the false perception of Down syndrome just was never really shifted into the gifts, you know. It didn't it it didn't shift properly into the gifts and the beauty that is there, and the way we are affected as a community. And a lot of people miss out on that. You know, a lot of people really do. Would you tell us a little bit about the the post that Stephen found, the one that he saw, the concert, and how that came about? I'm, I mean, your family, your family is just like a bunch of advocates with ease. Can you tell us about that concert? Well, uh, we were playing in St. Petersburg at a um, in an auditorium. I got tickets for my parents and all their friends, so. Uh, you know, they got VIP seating and Kathy was with them. <laughs> One of our road crew guys wakes up on, on his tour bus and walks out and sees, you know, 50, uh, you know, 70 year old people walking by. And he thought, I'm at the wrong concert. <laughs> What's going on? So anyway, I, I, and I don't know how it actually, how it came about, but I might have just said to uh, our singer, Natalie Merchant, I said, can Kathy come up and sing a song with you? And she said, yeah, of course. Because, <clears throat> you know, when we were, uh, when we were starting out, we'd go down to stay at my parents' house. All the boys slept on the floor in sleeping bags. Natalie shared a room with Kathy. <laughs> that was an experience for her. But so she and Kathy were friends. So Kathy came up on stage and they sang a little bit of, I want to hold your hand by the Beatles. And of course the crowd went nuts. Uh, you know, there were tears all over the place. Kathy was ecstatic. You know, her, her big grin got bigger, like the Joker. It was like all the way to her ears. <laughs> and after the show, we're in the, we're in the dressing room. Kathy was there. And uh, I, I almost always go out and say hi to the crowd because I, I like talking to them and stuff and sign autographs. And Kathy came out with me. So there was a line of people getting Kathy's autograph. And she thought that was pretty cool. It was it was pretty special, and you were gone a lot for uh, in, during that time. I guess touring and and um, how did that evolve your relationship with with Kathy? Well, I certainly I regret some of it, um, but it was my parents' decision to retire and move to Florida, so that made it hard, um, and I missed a lot of Christmases. The first five years of my our marriage. I was gone for three. We worked pretty much nonstop from 81 to 91. We worked really hard for those, for that decade of years. It's, a, it's all encompassing. You know, there's so much travel and so much work and 
trying to be creative and uh, it just really just consumes your life. It, it was enough to try to think of my wife. So it was, you know, my parents and Kathy and my and Leanne were often just sort of in the back of my mind. I didn't, you know, you know, I was in, we, I don't know where I was. I was in Vancouver or something when Leanne called me and said our mom was going to die. She had cancer. So we were, luckily we had about a week off. So the band flew home and I flew down to Florida so I could be there. And I got to see Kathy before she died. I think my dad called and said, can you come down? And I said, yeah. And she had Alzheimer's. When she was born, they said she lived to be 20 and she lived to be 57. A lot of it, thanks to advances in medicine. You know, she didn't have the, the heart problems and uh, is, you know, respiratory problems, which I think was, you know, their, their early causes of death. So yeah, she had Alzheimer's and uh, she was lying in bed and I walked into her room and I said, hi, Kathy. And she smiled. She recognized my voice, you know, and a big smile on her face and she really couldn't talk, but, you know, she uttered a few sounds. I guess that was, that was good that I got to see her. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Medical advances are changing so much in the lives of people with Down syndrome. We just did a, a interview with with uh, Dr. Brian Scottko, who he's in Boston and he does so much research. And he had said about fifty percent of people with Down syndrome end up uh, getting uh, some kind of dementia or Alzheimer's. And, and they're um, working on that. And there's really a lot of study on yeah. that. So that's going to be a big hurdle for for not only the Down syndrome community. I mean, that's something that we really need to do more research on. You know, think about you know, where we were 10 years ago and where we are today with medicine, where are we going to be in 10 years from now? Um, so I think there's great hope. As long as they get funded, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they need, they need the money to do it. And I'd certainly like to see guys like Jeff Bezos and uh, step up and start forking out some of his cash yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, helping with some of these things. I mean, there's, uh, don't get me started, but uh, so few have most of it. And, uh, you know, they need to share it. And, you know, just look how fast they got this vaccine together or they're going to get this vaccine together yeah. for the COVID. And it's because so many people were dying. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it can happen. It, you know, you need the um, incentive in yeah. the motivation. And that's. Yeah. That's... And and the thing with um, Down syndromes, um, I, I don't know how many. What's the population? Do you know of uh, of America? How many people there are with Down syndrome? I don't know the population. I've always heard, I've always heard one out of every seven or eight hundred births is a, is someone with Down syndrome. So you know they're not obviously not at the top of the list without uh, advocates like you and my parents and you know every I think almost every parent uh, be, I, I would hope so can, be, can become if they have the uh, ability and time and and uh, desire to be an advocate. You just brought up so much because, first of all, when you're talking about the medical and that Kathy was only supposed to live till 20 and she didn't have these um, pre-existing conditions like with your heart and respiratory. Now, even children who are born with the heart and respiratory, medical advances has kind of eliminated those as, you oh, know, yeah, life like enters. 50% uh, of kids uh, born with Down syndrome have a, a, a little hole in their heart. Yeah, and, Kathy did. And that's or one so valve. Oh, what did they do? Did they, did she have surgery or um, did it just kind of take care of itself? Medication, you know, and she, uh, she had surgeries on her eyes to try to make her eyes better. You know, she had to wear pretty thick glasses. But, um, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money. And, you know, back then there really wasn't insurance. You know, you went to the doctor and you paid it when you left. But, you know, they found the money to uh, get her, you know, surgery on her eyes to uh, help her so she could read, which helped her quality of life. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, um, good insurance for everybody would go a long way. Yes, it would. Oh, yes, we're, we're right would. with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you talk about education. That is still, you, you, I mean, your parents made these leaps and bounds before it became, you know, the Individuals with Disability Education Act. Before that ever existed, your parents were, were pushing for that. We're still fighting for that. We're still experiencing pushback on educating our son, which is, but, you know, you fight and, and you do see a lot in the community that 
you know, they're told we can't educate your child. And so they say, okay, or they're told this is all that they're able to do. And they say, oh, because it's coming from people who you should be able to trust, you know, so that but conversation. Kathy's generation really, you know, set up for what movement's happening now, happening now. They, you know, they set a, up for the moment. And, and it's still, it still is something that more people need to hear, more people need to see that, you, first, that this still exists, and secondly, for the amount that this still exists, look at how how far and and just the leaps and bounds that have been made. My my wife's a, a teacher. She teaches third and fourth grade, um, and she's fabulous. Her kids love her, but they they'll, they'll get some special needs or some kids with learning disabilities, and they struggle to find you know to find an an aid that could come in and give them a little extra special time, you know, to help them out. And, you know, that's just insane. Who's in charge? <laughs> it seems to come down to money, I think, but there's so much money in the system and there's so much money there. It's, it's it just needs, there's yeah. loads of money. There's, there's yeah. always enough money. It's just not a priority. It's not. That, that, that idea that um, it was in the times, uh, this new sort of study of economics, that you don't have to borrow from the defense department to pay for education. There's plenty of money, you know, and people with disability are real, are the silent minority. Yeah, they are. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're the first to get cut and the last to get brought back on. I think that's the part that definitely does still need to change. And I, because I, I believe that because that is the societal approach, then it does affect the way the perception has changed, and even just the in in the family, in the families that have someone when they receive that diagnosis, that 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 diagnosis also carries the weight of the the societal perception, and um and and then we miss out on all this goodness, all this good stuff, right? And all how far, uh, 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 even Kathy's generation, how? How much more could they have shown us if they were given supports that are even available today? You know, like because the things she did, living independently, um, having a job, a bank and account, and the once she not, had not to burning be down the house, yeah. and I mean right. that, like oh uh, no, our I'll daughter would have just shot out the house, been gone. We had a, we had like, a fire a in the oven with the salmon, and I said, "Run!" Yeah, I mean, so. I, I wasn't putting anything. <laughs> I was like, to "Oh, I let's was like, just go, take care of this." Run. She's like, "Just go, just tell like, everyone, go, just go, burn it go." Down. Just because grab the computer. So yes. I was so afraid of that flame that came out. And so even just that, like, absolutely is the fact that look at everything that she accomplished yeah. in, in relationships and also personally as just a, a, a human with her goals and having a job and being an artist. And, yeah. a, you know, what, what more opportunities would have been there for her? We've got some of her artwork on the walls. She uh, she did some very abstract things uh, that were really beautiful. You know, everyone everyone has worth. Mm -hmm. Everyone, you know, I just find it hard that everyone isn't treated like that. Well, I think sharing her story and and your story and your family as an an, an advocate that I would say that that hopefully lights a fire of advocacy in families today that your your parents did that before it was a thing and they did it because you know that was what they had to do and wanted to do and they made a change and they they put that foundation down for us that we need to continue to follow in those footsteps and continue to make a change they really did just uh, pass it forward yeah um i'm i'm very proud of them for doing that and they were Neither one of them was college educated, but they were very smart people because, you know, back then it, they really taught you critical thinking in high school. Uh, you know, my dad had 22 years in the military and, um, you know, they were bright, passionate, compassionate, friendly people. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like them, but I'm special because I had Kathy, you know, and there aren't, there aren't many people out there that have that. I mean, you don't want to see a child born with learning or physical disabilities, but it happens. And I'm glad it happened to me. You know, our podcast is called If We Knew Then. You know, Stephen and I always always tell parents if we knew then that we wouldn't have worried so much or stressed so hard or maybe paid as much attention to things that were said 
But do you have an if we knew then uh, statement that you'd like to share? If I knew then, I wouldn't have thrown that uh, that kickball. I'm a sister so hard. <laughs> <laughs> we love your stories. Any any story because I think that it's you know parents parents are listening. Honestly, they 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 do have they have such concerns when they get a diagnosis, and one of one of them is about having a sibling and I think that in your life, stories and your be. your yeah what your life is going to be and your story your stories are just that you know it's going to be it's going to be and and I I love your stories and you have you t- you tell them with such joy um that how could how could having a sibling with down syndrome ever be thought to be a a, a negative because you clearly have received so many gifts from that experience I had a friend who, um, she was, he was very short in stature and he kind of looked like John Denver, kind of. And Kathy loved John Denver. And if I knew then, I probably would have done this. <laughs> but I, I brought him over and said, Kathy, you got to meet John Denver. He's no. <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. I know. I love it. I, <laughs> how did she, how did she, how, how did she respond? Oh, are you kidding? Gave him a hug. You know, I think, I think she made him a pot holder. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> why, why would you take that back? Why, no, why, it's so why beautiful. Would you it's so no, beautiful. I, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't like cheating on her, you know, yeah. and, and I always liked, liked it when she won. And, you know, I suppose when I was, you know, when I was really young, I didn't know the difference. I was still learning that. And, um, you know, I feel proud about beating her at hearts. But, you know, then once I figured it out, it didn't matter. Just a game anyways. But, oh, God, she told everyone she knew Jack Denver. (laughs) 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 Oh, God. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I would, you know, I wouldn't change anything. You know, maybe I wish I could have seen her a little more before she died, but uh, uh, you know, she led a great life. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about Kathy? Any memories or thoughts or anything you'd like to leave leave the audience with? You know, like I, I said it. Um, I'm special. I'm a special person because I had Kathy in my life. You know, blessed and lucky. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, you're welcome. I enjoyed this very much. And so did we. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod, and you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod, or visit our website, If We Knew Then.com, to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then. Thank you.